All right, we should be ready to go. Good morning, I am Ron Carruthers. This is How to Escape the Retirement Tax, tax Trap, the Wealth Building Practices Used by the Top 25%. And um, we're gonna go through here the format of the presentation. Let's see if we can get this working here. Um, this obviously states that everybody's situation is different. However, it is based on current tax and rule. And so we can source anything on here. I try not to cram up the screen too much, but I have all that there. And really what it tells you here in that middle paragraph is um, everybody's situation is unique. So when we're done here, if you have questions or want to chat about your situation, I'll tell you how to get in touch with us. If you're not familiar with me, that's me in the upper right hand photo uh, on the left. That's my wife, Sylvia. That's my oldest daughter, Jessica, her son, I mean, her husband, my son-in-law, Matteo. They live in London. And um, that's the Tower Bridge last December at about four o'clock in the afternoon. It gets dark early there. Um, there's Brennan and Jessica over on the left. That's my uh, middle and younger kid. Jessica's a little, I mean, Lexi's a little vegan that goes up to um, Berkeley and lives in a school bus. Brennan's the one living in South America, and then that's Star the Wonder Dog. So um, I've been in financial services, by the way, just so you guys know, this is my 30th anniversary next month. And um, what I've noticed a lot of, I'm an independent fiduciary financial and tax advisor. And all that really means, if you're not familiar with that, is independent means I don't work for one company. Um, I'm product agnostic. We use lots of different strategies for our clients, lots of different um, investment firms, depending on what a client's looking for. So I'm not tied to one bank strategies or one mutual fund strategy or one insurance company strategies. Um, fiduciary simply means I am legally held to the standard <clears throat> of always acting in my client's best interest. It's literally the legal standard that is applied to everything I do when I'm audited. And financial and tax advisor simply means I work on both financial and tax matters. So um, over my years of working with different families, 30, three decades, um, we've noticed some commonalities as clients have transitioned into retirement. And really, we're going to focus on three big risks that everybody face when they transition to retirement. Kind of what the common knowledge is about retirement and the common theories, and then we're going to look at one strategy of the many that I apply for my clients and how it works in the real world. And it's one that a lot of people haven't heard of or don't really understand, so that's why we're spending so much time working on it. So this class is a little more risk and one strategy specific, whereas a couple of weeks ago, and you can find it or ask us for it, we'll send you the link to it. I did a separate class that chatted more about the process that we go through. So this one's a little more strategy specific, um, whereas the other one, like I said, went through process. So when I play this game live, if we think about it as family food, food, and I teach it to parents, and I ask them, or families, will you tell me what you think you have to make to be in the top 25% of incomes nationwide? The answer that we get most often is $100,000. When I ask those same families, okay, what do you think you need to make to be in the top 10% of income nationwide? The answer I get is 250,000. 5%, I get 500,000. And to be in the top 1% of incomes nationwide, the most common answer that I get is 100,000. I mean, $1 million. Jeez, I got to wake up. I'm drinking coffee, guys. And I've been up for a while. Um, but anyway, $1 million is what I get is the most common answer to be in the top 1%. And this is universal. I've been teaching this class for four years now, and I get these same answers every time. And occasionally I get an outlier. Someone's like, you know, $20 million, $20 billion to be in that top 1%. The most common answer is if you're making seven figures, you're definitely in the top 10% of 1% of income earners nationwide. Here's the IRS reality. If you want to be in the top 1% of income earners nationwide, you only, I'll say that, you know, 
somewhat jokingly, but you only need to make $480,000 a year and you are in that top 1%. And that's household income. Everybody come by. To be in the top 5%, you need to make 197,000. To be in the top 10%, 139,000. And you ready for this? To be in the top 25% of income earners nationwide, you only need to make $80,921 and you make more than 75% of the American families. So that should be a real eye opener. In fact, my joke living in Southern California is if you guys remember Occupy Wall Street, it's about 10 years ago, everybody was mad at the 1%. Like, man, some of y'all were mad at the 1% and you are the 1%. You just didn't know it at the time. So we're gonna come back and discuss that a little bit later on because that data is very relevant to how you prepare for retirement. Now, if we look at the different strategies of paying for retirement or planning for retirement, there's really three ways you can save money when it comes to taxes. You've got taxable accounts like brokerage accounts, You've got tax deferred accounts like IRAs and 401ks, and then you've got tax free accounts that we'll go through. And the reason that we list these different holes in the bucket is taxable, we really list like you would get um, taxed really twice on them. You get taxed on the money's accumulated, and then you turn around, it was just too noisy out there, and then you turn around and get taxed a second time when. You go withdraw the money and any capital gains get pushed through. And that's why we show it as a bucket with two holes. When you get into tax deferred accounts, your 401ks, your IRAs, your 403Bs, saving bonds, things like that, you get taxed one time when you go to withdraw the money. You the time that you're making the contribution. But what a lot of people don't realize is you're not only postponing the tax, and paying that tax, you're postponing the calculation of the tax also. And when we get into one of the risks, one of the three risks we're gonna to discuss today, what you'll see is that um, taxation can be a really big part of what you do in retirement. It can really hurt what you're trying to plan on. And then finally, we have the tax-free bucket. There's municipal bonds, except Technically, those aren't 100% tax free. And if you're not familiar with the way Social Security gets taxed, I'm actually doing a class on that in March and how Social Security works and how it gets taxed. But municipal bonds, any income that you receive that is federally tax free or state tax free, does count against your Social Security and can force your Social Security to be taxable. So it's not truly tax free. Then we have 529 plans that are tax free. Those get an asterisk because they're only good for college. Um, and by the way, I do a whole other class on college stuff. If you haven't seen that class and you have a kid that's going to college, um, you'll definitely want to check it out because it's not the best way to save for college because it counts against you. Kind of in the same way muni bonds count against you with Social Security. 529s can count against you for college. And then finally, we have the Roth IRA, which is 23 years old now. It was born in 1997. So those are your options, or are they? Do, do, do. So um, we're going to chat about some stuff there. But before we get to that, we've got to take a look at the three biggest risks that you're going to face during your retirement. And they are the stock market and market volatility specifically, longevity, and then taxes. So let's go through them quickly one by one. Here's how stock market volatility works. If you invest 100,000 into the market and you take a 30% loss the first year, the question is, what number do you need to get to break even? And the answer is 42.8%. So let's work through that math again. You put 100,000 into the market, you lose 30. The reflex answer when I ask people, how much do you need to get to break even? 
the answer is well 30 and, and that's not correct because the money that's only earning it's not a hundred thousand up here it's the seventy thousand so the seventy thousand has to work harder to replace this missing chunk over here so the actual math is you have to gain 42.8 percent just to get back to break even so the losses always hurt you more than the gains help you it's just something to keep in mind i posted online once math isn't money and people lost their minds on it like how dare you say that it is but the simple truth is anytime you take a loss that lower amount of money has to work harder and earn a progressively greater amount of income just to get back or a greater rate of return just to get back to break even and if you look through some of the bull and bear markets from 1926 through 2018, what you can see is it's a logarithmic scale, I think. So it doesn't exactly line up like an algorithmic scale would. But basically, you have your total return, your percent annualized, and all it's saying is we're going to have volatility. The market will always be volatile. The market will continue to be volatile. And at best, you get 15 or so years of a run before the market has a correction. Sometimes a short one, a six month one, sometimes a longer one, sometimes an even longer one, sometimes a really bad, really long one. But at the end of the day, the market will always be volatile. This will affect your retirement. And what happens here is if you look at the stock market of the last 18 years, where it went down starting in the 2000s it just barely got back up to break even then it dropped again then it took a few more years to get break even we call this 10-year window uh really it's 12 the lost decade because nothing happened during that time in 2019 if we put it be up here maybe even up here but at the end of the day the average rate of return over the last 18 years is 4.37 percent now there's a very famous tv and radio personality that talks about the 12 percent rate of return that the market earned and that's true going back 100 or so uh 100 ish years or 75 ish years but lately with these two big downturns the market's actually done closer to 4.37 percent and, and again if we included 2019 absolutely no doubt it would be a little bit higher but nowhere approaching 12 percent which i still get clients wanting to use that number as what they base their retirement on and the question becomes you know look do you want me to show you what your retirement might be or what it will be and so um 12 percent we just don't find realistic and then on top of that four percent that's what the market did but we have to take into account management fees, which can be one to two percent, even reasonable management fees like that. Inflation runs two to three percent, and then taxes get calculated on that. So when you add all that together, a lot of people over the last 20 years really earn nothing. They might feel like they earn more, but when you really sit down and break down the math, they netted nothing in real dollars, adjacent uh, inflation adjusted dollars over the last 20 years so that's risk number one and again like we showed you on that first chart or one of the first charts going back to 1926 it's not going away anytime soon interesting note on that in fact we'll talk about it here in our next risk which is longevity um if you guys aren't familiar that's a picture of mount everest since the 50s more than 4,000 people have scaled by the way one of my students on the college side of our firm did a two-week san francisco to san francisco summit where she trained at um oxygen chambers in san francisco like did a body hack and then she did a speed summit they call it i don't think she set the i think she set the record for the fastest amount of time you know literally it was 14 days from she left san francisco to being back in san francisco her name's roxanne vogel v-o-g-e-l you can check it out it's a great story business insider did a bunch on it and local news did a bunch of stuff on it but since the 50s more than 4,000 people have scaled 290 people have died here's the interesting part 
they made it to the summit, the majority of them, no problem. It wasn't the summit thing that created the problem. It was getting down the mountain because you're in what's called the death zone above a certain altitude and getting up to the mountain, getting your photos taken, enjoying the view and getting back down is where the majority of people that have perished have run into trouble. And we use this analogy because money works the same way. The five years before you retire and the five years after you retire, we call the retirement red zone. Death, sounds, death zone sounds a little bit extreme there. But if you look at the math on it, it's the most critical time because mistakes, just like being above that oxygen level on Everest, mistakes are magnified there. In fact, one of my other clients just did a, um, took a helicopter up to one of the base camps recently. And she's like, we got out of the helicopter, we had seven minutes. And they were like, you have to be back on this helicopter in seven minutes so we can get back down and get you back to a reasonable altitude level. When you retire, five years before and the five years after are the most critical years because everything is magnified there, like being up at that mountain. And an investment firm did a study that showed that you could have two couples making the same average rate of return with three positive years and one negative year, but if you reverse the order, so one couple had their best year first, then their second best, then their least best, but still positive in their negative year, versus another couple which had the negative year first, then the least good year, and so on. The second couple ran out of money 13 and a half years, taking the same withdrawal, same average rate of return, 13 and a half years earlier than the other couple did. So longevity becomes a factor because as people live longer, with the average female living 88 years of age now and the average male living to 85, that's your life expectancy. Once you make it to 65, those resources have to last longer than they did 30 or 40 years ago, where the average life expectancy was late 70s for both. So as we've lived longer, that those dollars have to last longer and this becomes trickier. And what we tell our clients is, the goal here is not just to retire, but to have the money last at the same or better standard of living adjusted for inflation through your life expectancy, no matter how long that is. And as a couple, the odds are if both of you make it to 50, uh, 65 years old, this comes right from the Society of Actuaries, there's a 50% probability that one of you makes it to age 90. And so when we tell people to plan, and there's a 5% probability that one of you makes it to age 100, you at least want to have the money planned to live to age 100. And then you're safe. If you're planning on early 80s and you last longer than that, this becomes a huge problem. And longevity is a risk multiplier because it affects everything else that you would do. So inflation, lowly 3% inflation would take a car that cost $50,000 a year last year. We gotta update these for 2020. And if you replace your cars every 10 year and you go back and you get the exact same car, just in a different color, 10 years later, that same car, not a better car, not a faster car, just the new model of it, is gonna cost instead of 50,000, it's gonna cost 67,000. And if you have to buy another car 10 more years later, that same car is gonna cost 90,000. That's the effect of 3% inflation. So right here, that's all that is, is 50,000 to 90,000. That's your difference here. And Added on top of that term care, which is another factor, and let me go over some of the stats of that. The odds that you will have your house burned down in a fire are one in 1,200. The odds of you getting in a car accident at some point 
are one in 240. Now that should be really good for the rest of you because I've been hit like five times. But the odds that you'll eventually need long-term care are one in two. And yet you're required to have homeowner's insurance. You're required in most states to have some baseline level of car insurance. And yet you're not required to have long-term care insurance. And by the way, the costs of nursing home care, we shot this for my dad about three years ago before he passed away. It looked like he was gonna to need to go into facility and it was 84,000 a year. And that was an accurate number. But with that lowly 3% inflation in 10 years, that means it's gonna cost about 113,000 a year and it will continue to spiral out of control. So longevity is the risk multiplier for everything else. The longer you're alive, the more stock market volatility will hurt you, the more long-term care costs, the more inflation will affect you, all those sorts of things. Now let's talk about taxes, a subject very near and dear to my heart. In fact, I'm finishing up a course for um, people, predominantly the first course will be on people who are self-employed. It should be out in a couple of weeks. We'll call it by March 1 on uh, how to legally minimize your taxes, particularly if you own a business, um, because most people do overpay their taxes. But let's go back to our little chart here, which uh, is our income and our educated guesses and stuff like that. And so let's look at what share of the burden each taxpayer category pays. The top 1% pays 37% of the money that the U.S. Treasury collects each year. Now, that doesn't mean they average paying 37%. In fact, in some cases, they average much more than that, even though the tax rates cap out um, when you factor in state tax rates and alternative minimum taxes and things like that. Someone might be paying substantially more than that. But as a group, the top 1% pays 37% of all the taxes collected by the U.S. Treasury. If you make 197,000 or more, the top 5% collects 58%. The Treasury collects from them 58% of the total money that, that gets collected. Am I saying that right? You guys know what I mean. They're responsible for paying uh, almost two thirds of the total money the government collects. Well, I guess if you're in the top 10% making $139,000 or more, now you're, in the, you're paying two thirds of the total taxes, a little more than. And if you're in the top 25%, that means your family makes more than $80,921 household income a year. It has gone up a little bit since these two, 2016 numbers, but not a ton, you're paying you and everybody else above you in the income brackets are paying 86% of all the taxes collected by the treasury. That's why anytime a politician is like, well, these tax cuts don't help the poor, that's disingenuous to start out with. You know, poor families, poverty level, and you know, above poverty level families aren't really paying any taxes that burden falls on the top 25%. And politicians know that, they're just pandering. Um, but if you're here or above, then taxes are going to factor heavily into this equation. Now, if you look at that, but you can check it out later at usdebtclock.org. We have the national debt up in the upper left-hand corner and that uh, adjust daily, I, I pull it for these classes once a year. I make myself crazy trying to do it all the time because it just, if you've ever been on this site, all the numbers are scrolling in real time. But here's what we'll zoom in on. The US national debt last year, it's 23 trillion plus now, was 22 trillion, 119 billion, 100 million four hundred seventy six thousand seven hundred fifty seven dollars the debt per taxpayer spread out if we all were going to just write a check as taxpayers the debt per citizen if they made every citizen man woman and child write a check for it it'd be sixty seven thousand each 
But if it was per taxpayers, because not everybody pays taxes, it'd be 180,000. That's some real numbers. Now, if you look at the top marginal tax rate, meaning the highest amount that your dollars can be taxed throughout history, there's your tar mar marginal tax rate since Congress started taxes down here in 1913 as a temporary, ha ha ha, income tax. And then World War I started sort of immediately spiked up, then it dropped back down, then it spiked back up again, stayed here. This is when 401ks and IRAs got started. And then lately, since Reagan came into office, taxes have come way down and stayed lower. But if you look at the average, the average is 57.5% as the top tax bracket. And every bracket along with it on poor and rich alike slides up and down relative to where this top number is. So the question is, knowing that the government has a debt of 67,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country, what direction do you think tax rates are going in the future? And most people say, oh, and not just a little bit up, like radically up at some point. Now, if you follow politics at all, you'll know a lot of the um, Democrats talk about it. It's kind of like the worst sales pitch ever. You know, like, vote for me, I'm gonna raise your taxes a lot. Um, that's like telling somebody you wanna get married to, like, marry me, I'm gonna get fat, I'm gonna ignore you, uh, I'm never gonna shower. <laughs> and the person going like, yeah, that sounds really good. So it, it's only a matter of time. And by the way, the three biggest tax deductions that most people have are mortgage interest, child exemptions, although those went away um, for the most part in 2018, and contributions to your qualified plans. By the time you get into retirement, hopefully your house is paid off or you're paying predominantly principal, not interest. Your children should have moved out by then and you're not making contributions, you're withdrawing. So that becomes a problem. And here's one of the problems with your IRA and your 401ks. You can't tell me how much of it is yours. So if you have a million dollars in, in an IRA or 401k, because we don't know what tax rate they're going to tax us at, and they can't seem to make up their minds, Trump lowered them. He's talking about going back and lowering them again. Uh, but somebody else is going to come along and raise them. And by the time, remember, if you're in retirement 20 or 25 years, that's going to happen a handful of times. So maybe, maybe your portion of that money is 700000 Maybe their portion is 300000 Maybe not. Maybe a lot more of it is their portion and a lot less of it is your portion. And remember, you don't have control over when this money starts coming out because the government mandates it. And God help you if you forget to take one of those. We had a client who, um, she's in a weird situation, so we don't, we only talk to her time and again, you know, like now and then. But she inherited her mom's IRA. Her mom passed away at 88. And she tried to fill out the paperwork for it. Fidelity supposedly lost the paperwork, who knows, but the distribution for 2019 didn't go through. It was supposed to be a $66,000 distribution. Well, 66,000 not getting distributed to the IRS, they slap if you forget to take a required minimum distribution, which starts now at age 72. Again, they just changed that, is 50% of the amount that you're supposed to have taken plus 100% of the tax that you owe on the entire amount. So her penalty, and I'm pretty sure we'll get it waived because we have a, a, um, a, um, a pretty good argument against it. And I don't mean it's the fidelity count. So if you're like, well, you suck at this, you're the worst independent fiduciary financial and tax advisor. When we last chatted in December, it was all taken care of, but then somebody dropped the ball in there it wasn't my account, it hadn't been transferred over, we would have been on that. But she's looking at a fifty to $55,000 tax and penalty on that distribution. Government doesn't play when they want their money. So we've 
thing is market will always be volatile. We don't know how long you're going to live, but the odds are longer than you might imagine. And that, you know, creates other risks along with it. And then the taxes in retirement are um, a big deal because we don't know what they're going to be. And because of inflation, we can't necessarily, and required minimum distributions and taxation on Social Security, we can't automatically assume that you will be in a lower tax bracket. Plus, we have legislative risk, we call it, which is we don't know what they're doing with it. So the question is great. Like, thanks, nice guy, you know, guy, it's a Monday, I was got the day off, and now you've just depressed the ever-loving hell out of me. Now what? So we're going to take a look. And before I transition to this, I want to make perfectly clear. What I set up front, if you came on late, is I'm an independent fiduciary financial and tax advisor. Strategy is always more important than product. You know, different, um, the mutual fund companies and the banks and the investment companies and the insurance companies, they really push product. This thing will do this. Even like Money Magazine, you know, if you look at the cover, we jokingly call it financial pornography, but every month they're telling you like, don't do this, do this. The 12 stocks done right now, the 14 mutual funds to own right now, the um, nine investments missing from your portfolio. If you follow that every month, you would have over a hundred different things in your account. So I'm gonna walk you through what we would look for in the perfect vehicle and then show you something that comes pretty close to it. Not perfect, but pretty close. But please remember, this is a one thing. It'd be like saying, if you're gonna go play a round of golf, all you need is this really amazing putter or this really amazing driver. That's good for part of it, but that's not, you need more than one club in your bag. So again, don't leave thinking, this is it, this is all we do. No, this is a strategy, but because it's so underutilized among the majority of Americans, but it really is utilized by the people at the top, the top 1% and corporations and banks. We're going to highlight just that, but then, like I said, you can go back and watch my other um, class on the process that we go through. But if we were gonna create a list of the perfect vehicle, let's look at what you would want. Would you want risk in that account? No, I'm gonna go right down the top here. Would you want guarantees of certain minimum performances? Absolutely. Would you want penalties to access your money? Hell no. Would you want use and control and liquidity of the money while it's growing? Yes. Would you wanna protect it? Yes. Would you want to be able to leverage it? Absolutely. Would you want it to grow tax deferred? Of course. Would you want the money to come out tax free? Uh huh. Would you want to be able to pledge it as collateral to get a better rate on any other loans that you take? Yup. Would you want to pay your payments tax deductibly? Uh huh. And lastly, would you, well, last two, would you want it to transfer efficiently? to your heirs without taxes, yep. And would you want payments to be made on, on your behalf if you were disabled and unable to do them? Yes. So those two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 items, we, we spent years working on this list and we found those are the 12 features of the perfect vehicle. Uh, now let's look at how a normal strategy compares. If you have an IRA or a 401k, do you have risk? Absolutely. Are there any guarantees? Nope. Do you have penalties if you want to access it early or late? Yep. Do you have control of the money? Maybe. Do you have a loan or a surrender? Is it protected? Nope. Um, now, certain states it's protected from lawsuits, but it's not protected in the sense of protected at all times. Can you leverage it? No. Does it grow tax deferred? Yes. But do you withdraw tax-free? No. Can you collateralize it? Nope. Are the payments tax deductible? Yes, they are. Are there disability benefits? No. And are, does it transfer efficiently um, to heirs? No. And its wealth transfer product, um, capabilities just got worse with the passage of the SECURE Act, which eliminated the stretch provisions of 
IRA. So now you have a shorter window of years. The IRS was like, no, we're not going to let you keep deferring the tax on this. You got to pay it, get us cashed out. We're in debt. But if you were out from your home and your CDs and your banks and annuities and real estate, and that doesn't mean we don't use these vehicles. We use all of them. But the idea is for most of these accounts, you're going to see more red than you, way more red than you are green. And so the question becomes, what is, quote unquote, a vehicle that gets us more green than red? And here's one where we get all green. Sometimes there are penalties and you do not get to make tax deductible contributions. Excuse me. And it is life insurance is the number one tax minimization retirement vehicle. Now to add, followed very closely or tied for first by having a, your own home-based business. So those two things, but one, one is an investment vehicle. The other is a strategy. So again, they don't compare and it's fair. Now, before you say uh, like, yuck, I'm out of here. If you weren't expecting this, stay with me. And I forgot to put the words in properly structured life insurance is the number one tax minimization retirement vehicle. Now, let me show you why. There's a very unique combination of three tax benefits that life insurance gets that nothing else gets. Number one is obviously it's life insurance. So the death benefit is tax free. And most people may or may not realize that. But again, when we're talking about penalties of up to the entire amount of your RMD on a 401k, suddenly tax-free death benefit may not sound that bad. What a lot of people don't realize, though, is you can defer taxes on the cash value. So while it's accumulating, if it's structured properly, all those taxes are deferred. And you get tax-free loans and withdrawals, which are what make it really unique. They're Roth-like features that a lot of people don't realize. Now, if you watch TV or listen to the radio, you probably heard, oh, it has high fees, the rich returns are very low, you can't touch it, it has hidden costs, Ugh, very scary. But the truth of the matter is, the fees are actually pretty low, a little bit higher the first 10 years, but then they level right out and are actually much lower than comparable mutual funds or 401ks or anything like that. The rates of returns are very competitive. You do have the ability to access your money even before retirement age and the costs are fully disclosed right up front. Now remember, I keep saying the words properly structured. It's gotta be set up right. And if we go back as a wealth strategy, you have to remember, if you make more than $80,000 a year, you are in the top 25% that's paying 86% of all tax revenue. So if you're there or planning on being there, the other 75%, that is who Susie Orman and the Dave Ramsey strategies of the world work for. Cut up your credit cards, pay cash for things, get your bills paid off, all those sorts of things. Because if you're making less than $80,000 a year, particularly if you're trying to support a family, it can be really difficult. We've got other issues. But if you're over here on the right-hand side of this, we've got a different set of rules for you because you're paying the majority of the taxes. So we come back to these three unique benefits Again, notice tax-free, tax-deferred, tax-free, taxes become a much bigger issue. And we, for retirement purposes, use a specific type of life insurance the majority of the time called Index Universal Life. And let me walk you through how that works. First of all, let's go over the death benefit is really one of the main reasons why you buy life insurance. And most people are way underinsured. And there is no such thing in the life world as being overinsured. It's like saying you can't have good enough car insurance or health insurance or homeowner's insurance that if something happens, you get two cars out of it or you get two houses out of it if your house burns to the ground 
or you get two hearts out of it. If you need open heart surgery, you get one heart, you don't get a spare one that you're gonna take home because you have two insurances. You cannot over-insure the value of your life. There is financial underwriting that takes place once you go above a certain amount and you need to prove to the insurance company that you're getting a reasonable amount for your income that you earn and the number of years you have until retirement age. And the death benefit of life insurance can use income replacement and college funding and business planning and covering out a mortgage and, and taking care of your loved ones and all those sorts of things. Because that, those dollars come income tax free. But this is the part that people don't realize. The cash value can grow income tax deferred in an IUL. It, the growth is based only on the gains to external market indexes and it never increases due to market volatility. So every year the gains are locked in. You're gonna keep them no matter what the market does the following year. And then the year after that it resets. So every year it starts over. So here's what happens and why this is so powerful. If we go back to our market volatility that I showed you at the beginning, we can take a real life account if we went through the end of 2018, and again, 2019 is gonna look a little bit better, but not a lot better, and both accounts would have grown if we put 100,000 into an S&P 500 account, and we took 100,000 and put it into an index universal life account because what happens is the life insurance gets a zero rate of return on the years the market drops, as you can see over here. And over here, and over here, here. So it looks like that. You get a reset and a zero rate of return and if you guys remember from elementary school, zero's your hero. Yeah, remember you have zero the hero day? This literally is that come to life. Zero is your hero because we don't take any markets, losses. We only get the upside of the market. So for all the people who tell you, oh, the market's great, it always outperforms, that isn't always the case. In this case, which are real numbers, we would have more than double the amount of money in the life insurance that Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman told you have high fees and terrible things after accounting for all those fees. So if we look at the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, his rule number one is never lose money. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. And so those losses, like we talked back to one of those very first screen, always hurt you more than the gains help you. Now, I get asked this all the time, well, how do they do that? Well, here's how they do that. For every dollar that you give them, or every thousand dollars that you give them, 950 of those dollars go towards a corporate bond fund in their general portfolio with the sole goal of being worth $1,000 uh, uh, $1, at the end of the year. So 950 goes in here, it just boring corporate bonds, mortgages, you know, stuff like that, investment grade bonds. And so at the end of a year, we have $1,000 again. That's boring. The $50 over here is used to purchase long-term options on different indexes, whatever index you tell them or indexes you tell them you wanna participate in for the upcoming year. And those options, one of two things happens. If the market stays the same or drops, the option expires worthless mm -hmm. with no losses though. And we're still back whole again. We started with a thousand, we ended with a thousand, and out of this money is where the company takes, you know, a half a percent or one percent to pay their expenses. So if the market goes down, we're protected, just like that screen showed us, where we just have the same amount of money. If we had a hundred thousand at the beginning of the year, we have a hundred thousand at the end of the year, regardless of what the market did. But if the market increases in value, then we turn around and now we get those gains locked into our account, put in, we get to participate fully in those gains, sometimes up to caps, or sometimes we get more than a hundred cents on the dollar, they call it a participation rate, sometimes less, but those gains are ours. 
and you can switch strategies one year to the next. You can break it up like you do. It's very flexible, but the one thing that we have in common with any of the strategy is we're never gonna take a loss. And none of our money is actually in the market. It's sitting outside the market. And then comes time to retire or use the money for a wedding or to pay for a kid to go through school or to pay off some debts or to take advantage of an opportunity, we can take that money income tax free. We do it using a policy loan. I won't bore you with the details on it now, but just know that the strategy works. And um, this is all permanent portions of the internal revenue code. So this is not, you know, some loophole, three different sections of the internal revenue code address each one of these. 101A1, death benefits are tax free. 7702, it grows tax deferred and it defines life insurance. Section 72E, loans aren't considered distributions and are not subject to income tax. And I'll show you how we use those in a moment. So now if we go back to our original list of benefits, and different ways of saving money, we have to add IUL to the tax-free bucket. So let's take a look at a case study. Now this is a fake name with a stock photo for a real client. Um, so we just were like, look, it's, you know, we're gonna take, this is what I do all day, every day, but we won't use a real client, and that's not really them. But this is what we did for them. So let's take a look at how we funded this in the real world without altering their lifestyle. Check it out. Both of them, in many cases, are contributing 401k contributions, or you might doing, be doing that above the match. Our rule of thumb, do it right up to that match. But remember, anything above that, we don't know what your tax rate's going to be. So we should look at something different for that rather than putting it in an account where we might lose 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 cents on the dollar down the road. We don't know. So in this case, we redirected $10,000 here because they were contributing 7,500 each, 15,000. We paid the tax on it. So there's your pre-tax amount. We paid the taxes on it. So we went down here. At the same time, they were contributing about 600 bucks a month to mutual funds. So we were like, look, let's keep liquid money for six to 12 months of, of emergency income in cash. Now money inside an insurance account, once we built that up, can be counted as that emergency fund because we can get that on a few days notice. So we generally recommend our clients have about a month's cash, like literal greenbacks stashed away somewhere. We recommend they keep, you know, Money above that once they built up an IUL or another account and that type of account because it counts and then they can do what they want with the rest. But remember, a mutual fund, you get taxed every year on the gains, whether you touch the money or not, on those gains and then you get taxed on them again. And you often get taxed on the interest and dividend portion at your highest rate. Not always because there's qualified dividends. So we redirected that $7,000 a year. And then check this out. They were putting aside $250 more a month towards their mortgage because they'd heard that was a great strategy. But if you think about that, the interest portion really only cost them about two and a half percent because they get it deducted on the 4%. And I've never understood that. Even like Dave Ramsey's logic really doesn't make sense there because if he's saying on the one hand, you're gonna get 12% on your mutual funds, and your mortgage is only three or four or five percent, why would you ever rush to pay that off when that money could be redirected to something that's going to make 12 percent? Now again, we disagree that it's going to make 12 percent. You know, it kind of did once, but will it really have a long term? I don't know, but regardless, we turned around and took this 3,000 a year and redirected it to an IUL. So we came up with $20,000. And again, this is very common for the IUL scenarios that I do without touching their lifestyle, saving any extra money. And we put something called the wealth report for them. And by the way, I'll show you in a minute how to get your own personal wealth report as part of an overall strategy, not a thing, 
Remember, this is one thing that we do that's part of a comprehensive strategy, but the wealth report does a really good job of explaining how it works and explaining how it works against the alternatives. And one of the pages on the wealth report looks like this, page 10, where it shows the dollars going in into four different types of account, your personal IUL strategy, as well as if the money went into a mutual fund, a tax deferred account, like a 401k or an IRA and a Roth IRA, if you could put 20,000 into a Roth IRA, which you pretty much can't. And if you make over a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, you can't contribute to anyways, because they phase you out. And then what we show, like in their case, we showed 19 years of premium payments, you know, contributions, we never increased them. You can see in here where their cash value grew and their death benefit grew. And then we started taking tax-free contribution uh, distributions. In this case, we took $65,000 a year and take a look at how long it goes. So there's all your breakdowns of each different category. There's the same money going in, right? Wow. And then the same money coming out, this is the second page in there, so page 11, and notice in every single one of the other strategies, we ran out of money somewhere in the mid to mid 70s to early 80s, the very latest. And even this is misleading because we showed a steady rate of return in every case. But remember, if we took any losses, particularly in the five years before, or the five years after, it's gonna radically throw off this strategy. Whereas in our strategy, the worst we're ever gonna have is a zero rate of return or a couple zero rates return in a row. Our principal and all the gains we've made is completely locked in. And if you can squint and see down on the bottom there, we put in 380,000 through age 95, the client had withdrawn 1.95 million and still had a death benefit of 998,000. They were like, oh, I'm not gonna live to 95, okay. Let's say you lived to 86. You put in 380,000. You pulled out 1.365 million and you still had a death benefit of 673,000. I think you'd all have to agree with me, even if you came onto this call hating life insurance because of what you've been told about it. That beats getting poked in the eye with a sharp stick. There's your summary. 380,000, we pulled out 65,000 and at age 95, we still had almost a million dollars of tax-free death benefit to family, heirs, charity, whatever you want. And by the way, lest you think that this is something I thought up in the shower, this is actually a strategy wealthy families and corporations and banks have been using for over a hundred years. In fact, Walt Disney used his cash value to help fund Disneyland when he was originally getting started. J.C. Penney, after the market crash of 29, when all the banks were going under, he used the insurance companies because they're held to reserve requirements that are much higher than a normal um, bank. In fact, it's an area, if you doubt me on this, look up bank-owned life insurance, bully. And you'll see banks like Bank of America, Chase, other banks have billions of dollars of cash and cash value life insurance. Why? Because it's unassailable capital. It's held, it's considered tier one capital, the most secure capital you can have. And so while all the banks were going under and the stock market was crashing, JC Penney was able to use the cash inside his life insurance account to meet payroll, continue the stores opening and thriving when competitors were closing. And more recently, the top paid, I don't know if this stat is still true because I don't really call, follow college football, but at the time, he was the top paid college football coach in the nation. And part of the way they comped him was a deferred compensation that utilized IUL. I actually know one of the guys that helped design that account for him. And one of my clients is actually his, um, was his like peewee hockey coach back in Michigan for him and his brother. So um, here's our summary. We talked about the three biggest risks that you're gonna face during retirement and the importance of preparing for each one. I also showed you, if you remember that chart, which by the way, you can email 
email me and I could send you a copy of that chart where it laid out each of the common retirement vehicles and how in most cases it doesn't really align with what people say they want. And then we talked about the number one minimization retirement tax vehicle. Again, it's not the thing, it's a thing that you should be paying attention to because it allows you to diversify the taxes that you receive and protect against longevity and protect against market volatility because the worst you get is a zero rate of return. So again, it's one club in the bag. It's not the bag. It's not everything you should do, but it's one area. So the question becomes, what next? Well, I mentioned there's a personal wealth report. So if you want to reach out, I'll show you the email address in a minute. It's info at roncarothers.com. Info at roncarothers.com. And what we generally do is have an intake meeting where we chat about you and your goals. And actually, this comes as part of a bigger report that we give our clients, um, which is the retirement income shortfall analysis, where we look at all areas of your retirement to see if you're on track against those risks. And generally, you get a wealth report along with it. And by the way, the report actually, this wealth report does break down the costs exactly how the costs are structured, exactly how the past performance is structured, and exactly how it compares like I was showing you to other retirement vehicles that you might participate in. Um, we could charge 295 actually for the planning process. We can charge more than that. Um, we're not. You get it and it says, hand in your form to the back of the room because I teach these live. Just email us this week and we'll get you set up for your intake appointment. And I'm probably booking about two to three weeks out. So it'll be early to mid-March before we can get you in. But I would urge everybody listening to this webinar to take advantage of it. It really will, along with that other report, the retirement income shortfall analysis, it really will help put you on the track, find the deficiencies in your strategy, and really help. It's generally a tweak or two that puts you in much better shape. And by the way, um, the team that I work with, Dan and Kevin and the guys that back them up, um, they've put together a whole series of videos on how um, these strategies compare. They're all about 10 to 12 minute videos against what you hear on TV or what you hear, read in Money Magazine. And so if you want access to all these strategies, all you have to do is email our office. We have a whole thing on like how to, how to finance your purchases, the traditional way of doing anything, things with the three types of money. Um, and we even have a consumer guide to proven wealth strategy and some of the frequently asked questions. So while we're scheduling your appointment and getting you in for that, which will probably take a couple of weeks, you'll have some videos that you can watch on that. We'll send you, we just got a bundle of information that we can send you. And so uh, just, so I'll give you again that email in a moment. We get your, we do an intake appointment a couple, three weeks out for your wealth report. We've got some videos for you and we've got that consumer guide to proven wealth strategies. This guy's an interesting cat here. His name's David Walker. He was the former comptroller general of the United States of America, like literally their number one bean counter. And he served under several administrations. And he quit because Congress wouldn't listen to him. They just kept kicking the can down the road and letting it be someone else's problem. And his comment was, we're heading to a future where we're either going to have to double federal taxes or cut federal spending by 60%. Now, if you look at what the majority of our spending is made up of, it's made up of entitlements like Social Security, Medicare, and things like that. And no politician is ever going to want to cut those. So at some point, if he's right, we're going to have to look at doubling taxes, or at least there's going to be a steady increase. And so we asked him at a conference, what is your advice to people looking at that and contemplating this type of account, adding it to their portfolio? Remember, it's part of a comprehensive strategy, but his advice was do it fast. 
While these benefits are a permanent part of the Internal Revenue Code, Congress has been known to change the Internal Revenue Code. Now, would they ever change? It would be too much to probably change what people are already doing because of the billions and billions of dollars that banks and corporations and, and Congress people and presidents themselves have, but it's not to say that they will allow this benefit forever. So you do want to pay attention to this. Guys, that is it for today. Um, you can reach my assistant at 760-607-7021. I'm not quite sure if she's working today. She hasn't told me yet because it's President's Day as I'm recording this. But you can email us. She'll reach back out to you no later than tomorrow, Tuesday, and get you set up with those, um, those videos and the consumer guide and all those other sorts of things, as well as getting your intake meeting so we can get what we need to put your reports together for you. And I urge you to take advantage of that. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, this will be recorded. It was recorded. We'll send you guys the link in a couple minutes here. I mean, not a couple minutes, but like by tomorrow, if you want to, if you missed any part or came on late or anything like that. And if you know anyone else who should see this presentation, as always, we'd appreciate the shout out. But that is it. I told you we'd go about, oh, my dog just woke up. I told you we'd go about an hour to an hour and five minutes. Look at that. 9.04 a.m. We started two minutes late. I'll run a tight shift, y'all. Anyway, that's it. I hope you guys have a beautiful day today, enjoying some good weather and some time off, and I look forward to chatting with you soon. Uh, take care, y'all. Have a good day.